righteous. Hallelujah. Praise Yahuwah. So I'm not going to be here long. Um, it's an it's a honor to me to be able to start off a new series for the women because for those who um, have been coming to the assembly for a while and those who maybe have been watching online for a while, you know that the women have been coming forth with series that are directed to the women. And um, the first series we started out with was Matters of the Heart. And we talked about the state of our hearts and what Yahuwah wants for us. And then we talked about preparing the bride, getting ready for the return of the bridegroom. And now we're going to go into um, a series that we're going to call Culture Keepers. And it's really, really progressive in the role of a woman is what we're presenting. So we talked first about our heart. You know, are we, are we submitted to Yahuwah? Is he our, our, um, our, our master, our Adonai? And then we talked about pre uh, preparing the bride. Is he our ish? You know, are we married to him in faithfulness? Are we betrothed to him? And now we're talking about once you've entered into that covenant relationship with him, are you keeping his home properly? Yeah, are you keeping his home? So um, the title of my message is The Ancient Past, Restoring the Culture of the Zadik. So I want to give you a couple of definitions real quick. Um, but before we do that, I want to read Psalms 1. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of Yahuwah, and in his law doth he meditate, meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For Yahuwah knows the way, or we could say path, of the righteous but the way or path of the ungodly shall perish. So we're talking about the righteous, and we're also speaking about them walking a specific path. So let's look at the meaning of the word righteous. And in order to define the word righteous, I have to kind of take you on a little walk here. Because righteous in the scripture, the word is Zadak. And it's one of the few words that you don't see a function right off the top when you say the word. You have to discern the function from what it's um, just opposed against. So let's define the word righteous. First, we've got to look at walk in order to define the word righteous. So walk. The Hebrew word for walk is halak. That's Strong's number 1980. It's used about 1,300 times in the Bible. In English, they would use the word follow instead of walk. In the context of the verse that we just read in Psalms 1, they would have put the word follow. Um, but for Hebrew people, the tangible words in their right, they make their words more tangible, more functional. And so the Hebrews saw life as a journey or a walk that they were on. That would be the Hebraic thought behind the word walk. It's a journey. I'm, I'm going somewhere. So I have um, a desired destination, right? So when we look at trying to understand righteous, we need to understand that it's connected to one's walk, the way one walks. Um, the ancient Hebrews were nomadic people. So when we think about Abraham and we think about his sons and their sons, they were nomads. They traveled a circuit through the wilderness. They went from uh, pasture to pasture, campsite to campsite, well to well. They followed the same path. It was seasonal. So they would make sure they were in a certain place at a certain part of the season, right? So there would be markers that they would follow in order to get to the well that they wanted to get to. We know we're gonna go this way, because remember they didn't have paved streets. They didn't have signs saying exit 33. You know, they had to remember the path. They had to remember it via markers. 
So to understand walk, the walk meant that you were on a journey that you had to follow markers to get to a, de a desired destination. Okay? So again, we're trying to understand righteous. So anyone who would leave the path that had been marked and outlined in order to get to the pasture or to get to the next well, if you veered off of that path or that circuit, you'd be lost. And you'd be far from your destination. And you might lose your life because you were lost. Right? So now understand the Hebrew, ancient Hebrews understood that walk meant, was a, an a allegory for life. And that anytime you walk, you have a destination. So in life, you have a destination. Okay, so now let's look at the word wicked. And this is all because we need to understand righteous. Okay, so wicked in the English language is a, a wicked person is one who performs evil. They're destructive. They do hateful things. But in the Hebrew language, the word for wicked is the word rasha. That's strong 7563. It has a different meaning. So if you look that up in the Strongs right now, it's going to tell you wicked, destructive person, hateful person. But the paleo, the ancient connotation of rasha, listen to this closely, is one who departs from the path. One who departs from the path. Okay, so those who choose a crooked path, those who depart from the prescribed path, those who walk off the path either by purpose or because they become lost. That would be the connotation of rasha, one who is wicked. Okay? Is that? So this is what Yahusha came to do. Yahusha came to restore the straight paths. And we're talking about Yashar uh, El. Yeah. Um, the context is what the Pharisees and what the elders did was the elders created divergent paths. Yeah. Uh, you just came to me, you said you had a dream when you went, it was a it was one way with a bunch of different other ways. Right? The writer, Shlomo says, or uh a uh, proverb says that there's a way that seemeth right to a man. Yeah. But the leader, the, the end of that way is death. Because like Ma said, they go in from place to place, they nomads. And in the ancient times, they would have marauders. They would have thieves that were on, on the side of the road. If they saw you um, walk outside the camp, they might just catch you and sell you into slavery. Mm -hmm. They might just catch you and sell you into slavery. If you did what? Got off. The path. <clears throat> what does that sound like? Who got captured and sent into slavery? Our ancestors, right? So, got, well, go ahead. So, yourself, yourself. What's that? <laughs> got what? Why? You left the ancient past. You left the paths that the elders set up through markers, through covenants, through, um, what you call those things? Uh, the altars, right? So you left from the altars and you went your own way. So let, so just saying, let's get back to Ma. So this is why when Yahu when was sent, Yahukunan, um, the immerser, he says what? He's the voice crying in the wilderness doing what? Make straight the path. Right, narrow it back down. Go back to the ancient ways, because there's divergent ways versus this path that Yahuwah laid out for you. Right, and one of the things that Babylon will tell you is that there's many ways, right? There's many paths. There's alternative lifestyles, right? But Yahuwah prescribed a specific path. So the Hebrew word for righteous is the deck. And what Zedek means, the ancient connotation of Zedek, is one who stays on the path of Yahuwah. I'll say that again. One who stays on the path of Yahuwah. So what does that mean, though? What does it mean to stay on the path of Yahuwah? So um, the Torah, I want to define the Torah for you, too. You know, a lot of times we'll say the Torah, and that means um, instruction, right? Or it means um, the law. Or it means the, the, the instruction, basically, written instruction. 
But the ancient connotation of the word Torah means instructions for the journey. Instructions for the journey. So if you're in a, a, a place of worship and they're telling you you don't need the Torah, they're telling you you don't need instructions for your journey. But the ancient, you know, uh, the ancient path is the understanding of those things which were placed in the law, the statutes, the commands, as well as the moeds. So that makes sense because when was the Torah given? In the midst of a journey. Yes. Okay, when so... Off, oh, go ahead. So when we went off the path and got sold into slavery. Right? Go ahead. Fine. That's okay. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. This is really good because you just talked about the journey, right? And you said... There's markers along the journey. So then you brought about Torah, and you said that it's to a specific destination or place. Well, if you look at the scripture where it says you missed the mark, you missed the marker. So y'all being all dead on me right now. Y'all y'all not understanding yet. Y'all not know y'all know where I'm going yet. It's easy. It's easy. Okay, so. And so we said in the original uh, paleo, the idea of Torah, the word Torah was instructions for a journey, but they've broken it down in modern Hebrew to mean doctrine. There's a big difference between doctrine and instructions for a journey, right? Okay, so I'm going to give you some scriptures. Um, Jeremiah 7, 23. Thus says Yahuwah, uh, master of hosts, or Adonai of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your Elohim, and you shall be my people, and walk in the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. That word ways could be path as well. Darak. Remember um, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am Yahuwah, your Adonai. There is no other. I am Elohim, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient time, what is yet to come, saying, my purpose will stand and I will accomplish all that I please. He has not changed his mind about anything that he planned from the beginning, right? His prescribed path has not changed. Though people came and brought new ways. Um, Psalms 25.10, all the paths of Yahuwah are mercy and truth. Unto such as keep his covenant, and his testimonies. Testimonies are the markers. When we read the scripture, we're seeing the testimony of Abraham. We're seeing the testimony of Dawid. We're seeing the markers in their lives, right? These are things along the path. Um, let's see. Uh oh, did I step on something? Okay. Okay. So the ways of Yahuwah were established from the beginning and are ancient as he is the ancient of days. So before there was a Torah, there was still an ancient path. The Torah built upon the ancient path, right? So the path of Yahuwah is synonymous with the culture of Yahuwah. You cannot walk the path of Yahuwah and not be in the culture of Yahuwah because his markers are his culture. Okay, so when I came into the awakening... Um, the first thing that I was introduced to basically was that, you know, I needed to dress differently. I needed to eat differently. I needed to um, cover my head and a bunch of things that people presented to me. But there was not a lot of understanding given to me regarding why I should do these things other than that's, that's what Hebrews look like, right? This is just what you look like. And so what I've come to understand is that there is a purpose to the things that I was encouraged to do. Right, and it has to do with the ancient paths. Okay, so let's look at the word culture because I want to define that word before we go too much further. So that's an actual Latin word. It means to till the land and prepare for crops, like to cultivate. That's where the word culture comes from. But the, the basic understanding of that word means to make ready the soil that you grow in. To make ready the soil that you grow in. So if you want to have an, um, an expected destination 
of the kingdom or a lifetime with Yahuwah, then you have to cultivate the soil that you grow in, right? So that you will be able to discern what the ancient path is, right? If your soil has been cultivated by the oppressor, by the land of captivity, if your soil has been cultivated by that, then your growth is going to be defined by that soil, right? So let's keep going a little bit more. So I want to read a scripture to you. Um, Isaiah 42, 6 says, I am Yahuwah. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you a covenant for the people. And, a, and, and I will give you a covenant and you will be a light for the nations. I think I abridged that a little bit. Um, can somebody read that for me? I want to make sure I get the whole scripture properly. Isaiah 42, 6. I, Yahuwah, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of, of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. So he's telling us he would give us a covenant, and that it was to be for, the, for a specific purpose. So um, our culture was not just for the sake of culture. It's for um, the sake of being a light. Yahuwah commissioned Israel, right? He commissioned Israel to be a light to the world, a light to the nations, and to be salt in the earth. So we don't do things just to do them. You know how they say, do it for the culture. <laughs> we don't do things just to do it. We are doing it because there is a meaning to it. It is the soil that we grow in. If we want to be righteous, a righteous planting, we have to grow in soil that is righteous. Right? So we want to be a righteous planting growing in the soil that Yahuwah has, has created, has cultivated for a righteous planting to grow in. So, <clears throat> so it, it's simple. You serve Elohim that don't do anything by chance. What does he do by chance? Nothing. Every last thing that's done, it has a specific order. Your toenails have a specific order. Your hair follicles have a specific order. Your taste buds. I mean, every last thing that happens to you, even going back to with Mata, my cultivating, I seen an article, and I, um, as far as I know, it's true. But even seeds, Yahuwah put, in, put seed, certain seeds in fruits. There's studies that say that the reason why he puts seeds in fruits is because when you eat, when the seed is in your mouth, the seed mixes with your saliva, and it, and it produces certain nutrients in the fruit once you spit those seeds to the ground. So even your spitting the seeds to the ground has a purpose and a function. Yahuwah don't waste anything. So when you're looking at these things, every last part of the culture is for a specific function. Some of y'all done put Mitri's on. You don't know that. Some of y'all, just by putting a Mitri on, has changed your countenance, changed your responsibility, changed your mind. So women, you've covered your head. Right? You'll know that that's um, rockily, something has changed in your inner woman. Even that, they don't mean that everything has changed, but it's a start. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's set a ball rolling or a wheel rolling. So, am I talking about cultivation? That's what she's talking about. How every last thing is to your building. Every last thing in you is for a specific purpose to get you to a point. So, who has created this culture, and that every single element of it, when it's all implemented, creates you to be. Um, uh, basically a supernatural man, a supernatural woman in the earth. Uh, we, we know in the, in the connotation that means for you to eventually become an Elohim. To be like Yahuwah. You've been Hallelujah. saying that in church, and now it's going to come full circle. You've been calling yourself Christ-like or Mashiach-like. Now he's giving you the formula to become that, to become a real Mashiach and not become Caesarea Borgia. So I'm, I'm not going to read these other uh, scriptures right here, to, but they all make the same point. Isaiah 49.6 Isaiah 52, 10. And the point is that Yahuwah commissioned us. He had a purpose and a point in calling Israel. He said, no other nation have I known. He called us his inheritance. He said that he wanted us to go forth and to show other nations how they were to interact with him, how they were to serve him, how they were to worship him, right? So he desired to cultivate, in, in other words, to create soil that we could grow up in that would help us to be righteous so that we could then adhere to the path, right? 
and in, in, in adhering to the path, we teach others his ways. So our culture should have revealed Yahuwah to the other nations of the earth, but instead we mingled with other things. We mingled with other things and we contaminated the soil that our plantings were supposed to come up in. And in contaminating that soil, we brought confusion. We brought the idea of different paths. And the different paths caused us to stray from the ancient path. It snared us. Yes. I'll, yeah, say that again, Murray. We did. I don't know if y'all know this, but we, were create, we created all those religions. Yes. All of them. We created Judaism. That was the, the teaching of the elders. You read about it with Mashiach. That's what he's talking about. He said how they, they strayed away from the path and started following the teaching of the elders. Eventually, um, the Ashkenazis took it and created Judaism. We created Christianity. Um, but no, it's most people think, some people think, ah, no, it's the white man's religion. Uh-uh. White, white people adopted it, but we created it. If you go back and study the, um, the, the, founding, the founding fathers, the original founding fathers, not the, white, not the for real white guys, but the original councils of Nazi and all those people, those were Hellenized Hebrews, Greek Hebrews, who had took the scriptures and merged them. You go back to Islam. The original founders of Islam, where he say, we, we, we've created snares for our own selves. We planted seeds in the ground, and they've bare thorns to us. All these things have entrapped us, right? If we didn't do these things, we wouldn't be in this situation. So, you know, and, and now we know that millions of us have sat under religions that have taught us that there is no way other than just knowing Yahusha. But they say Jesus, right? Now we know that scripture says that, that Yahusha said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. But he came to restore the ancient paths, to restore Israel to the path. Let me say that again. To restore Israel to the path. He did not, <laughs> Yahushua was not preaching from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what was he preaching from? The Torah, right? And he did not preach of himself. He said, I didn't come preaching of myself. What did he preach? He didn't preach Yahushua is your salvation. What did he preach? Return to Yahuwah. Glorify him. Keep so, his commandments. So Yahushua also said, I come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right. So the only way a sheep is lost is if it's went off the off the path. Come on, yeah. <laughs> Yahushua said he said the kingdom is like a bunch of seeds cast on a path. Some went into good soil. You was talking about spitting out seeds. So people been, we've been spit out. He said, I wish you were hot or cold. You're lukewarm. I got to spit you out. But he said that some will shoot up. You're just going to do a bunch of stuff for the culture. But they had shallow roots. As soon as they got hot, they withered up. Some was just on stony ground the whole time. They really was never meant for this path. While others were already set aside to get snared by those people waiting along the way. The birds coming in. That's what he's saying. I came for the lost sheep. And he said, my sheep know my voice. It's a bunch of sheep out here and he's speaking. And yet some people cannot discern his voice because they weren't meant. They were never planted in the good soil. He came for those who were already planted in good soil. He said, if, we, if you read it in the, in the original translation in the Greek, he says, the people who are of me come out of her. He says, the people who are of me come out of her. Right? Yes. So they had to be of him. That means... There's an origin. They originate from him. The scripture says we are in this world, but not of this world, because we don't originate from this soil. 
So now we have to figure out who are the Yahudi who say they are and are not. Who have been looking at white people? It is us. We've been the seeds that have been cast out. Jezreel, a cast out seed. Yehuda, to be cast, cast forth Thanksgiving. That's everything that we are has to do with being cast out. Even the bywords and, and the things that we've been caught have all been having to do with being cast out. But who will return back to him? Those who were of him in the first Those place. Those who originated from him. They were, he said, my sheep know my voice. He has been speaking. He's been speaking. He's been speaking. And who has responded to it? So you was talking about the, the word Sadak. So you know that word starts with a Saudi. Saudi is supposed to be a picture of a hunter. Really what it is is somebody who watches a path. That's really what it is. I was looking today, I was looking at the word shadow is, is Zal. It's, watch, it's he who watches the path of the shepherd. You have to be Yahuwah's shadow. That's how you find out what the culture is. That's, you have to discern the substance of the shadow and become the shadow. That's why it's the Torah Moshe, because he could discern the substance of Yahuwah, and he became the shadow. So Yahushua is not going to come destroy that. That is the culture. But some people haven't discerned the shadow. So me and Aqua were talking about how some people just, you, you have to keep following wherever he goes. The shadow cannot depart. Some people are just going to stay right there. The, the, the body done left, but you're trying to stay where the shadow used to be. That's why you have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. So, <clears throat> just going back to <clears throat> those directions on the path. Because if you're trying to move, the path is leading you to another place. You got to get instructions about how to get there. Which means you got to be in concordance. So you got to be in the same mind of the person that's leading. Because it could be that you don't have direction to get to that place. Somebody might have to tell you you have to turn to, turn to the left. You might have to turn to the right. You might have to cross over a body of water. But if you don't trust the person who's giving you the directions, you will never get there. You will never believe that you got to do those things. You will question why we got to. This is the reason why <laughs> they died in the wilderness. Yes. Because Moshe gave them directions. He's like, we don't need to go here. We don't got to do this. Why are we doing this? I'm going to tell. So, like, it was me and another imam. And we were following the caravan to go to Sukkot, right? And we were looking at the car in front of us. And we were like, yeah, we know that car was at the assembly. It, that, we know that car. But the Ema that was driving just didn't really trust that that was the right car. So the caravan went left, and we went straight, <laughs> right? And then we turned around and sped up and caught up to them again. And we're back behind them. Now we're behind a different car. Right? Caravan goes right. We go straight. And it was because we didn't trust who we were following. Did we, we didn't know if we really knew them. Is this really somebody that we, somebody from the assembly, or is this someone else? So the, the thought then is that one of the reasons why it's hard for us to stay on the path, on the ancient path, is because we don't really know Yahuwah. We're not, we're not really fellowshipping with him, and we don't know him in the spirit. We don't know his Ruach Kakodesh. This is why we can be covered from head to toe, head wrapped in everything, and cut somebody out. You know? <laughs> this is why we can, you know, be fully decked with our fringes and everything on, and, um, you know, lie and cheat our brother or our sister. Because we don't really know the one that we claim to be following. So we think we're on the path, and we're not because we didn't follow something else over to another place. Also because we don't, if the path don't seem familiar to us, yes. we would do our own thing. That's right. right. I was just about to talk to that about that. If that, the path doesn't seem familiar, go ahead. I, I was hoping that I was going to read this. I figured you probably was going to get to this. This is Jeremiah 18. Listen to what he says. 
Jeremiah 1815. <clears throat> You're my Yahoo 1815. Because my people have forgot me, that's the leader, right? They have burned incense to vanity. They've caused them to stumble in their ways from what? From what? From what? To walk in paths in a way not cast up. To, this is what it's going to do, though. To make their land in a perpetual hissing. Everyone that passed thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. Then he says, I will scatter them as an east wind before the enemy. I will show the back and not the face. I'm going to turn on them. This is what, what my is saying. Because you don't trust the path, you don't trust the person who's, who's telling you, because you unf the path that you're going down is unfamiliar. The scripture says it's for those wayfaring men. Mm -hmm. That means that this path is not, even though it's laid out, it's unfamiliar. It's unfamiliar territory that you got to walk down. It's not mainstream. It's not mainstream. So when you get, when you get in your mind, when it starts like, man, I don't know about this path, you start going on your own way. But that own way is going to lead you, according to Yahu, to captivity, to destruction, to be a desolate, per a perpetual hissing. So you have to understand. You have to discern. Or like they, Mike Ma said and yourself, you got to hear his voice. Because the sheep follow the shepherd whatsoever. So that means the sheep call, follow the shepherd to unfamiliar territories. Right. So what I was going to talk about is how do we perceive what the correct path is? How do we know that we're on the correct path? It's very difficult to know if we're operating from um, having been cultivated in the soil of Babylon. You know, because there may be things that have grown up inside of us that we don't really realize are there and are in operation. So I, I talked before about this word called paradigm. And that word is a Greek word, and the para means side. It's uh, like having a side-by-side -side view of something. But paradigm more deeply means to have your worldview, to have a worldview. And your worldview is shaped by something. Everyone's worldview is shaped by something. So the way you see life, the way you see the world, if I gave you some shades and the, the lenses on the shades were, sh were uh, colored in blue, when you look through those shades, everything you see, everything you see is going to have a blue tinge to it because you're looking through those lenses. There, it, there are lenses that we all look through. And where we got those lenses is the question. Most of the time, we got the lenses from family, from friends, from people we've spent years with or a lot of time with, or people who greatly impacted us in some way. We learn to see life through their eyes, right? And in doing that, we're not seeing the path. We're seeing something through someone else's eyes. So you may be given some information on the ancient path. Oh, well, you need to, find to you need to follow Torah, right? You come across someone who tells you, you need to follow Torah, the laws and the commandments. But you grew up in a church where your grandmama said and your mama said, that the law is done away with and you ain't got to follow the Ten Commandments no more. All you got to do is love Jesus. So that paradigm is going to keep you from returning to the, the ancient path. Because you're seeing something through a worldview, a perspective that was given to you. This is why you have to go into the scripture and read the scripture for yourself. Because we have lots of things that have been passed down to us. Some things we can articulate, some things we cannot articulate. They're behaviors that have been passed down to us that we don't even realize have been passed down to us. So those are, those are plantings. Those are things that came from the soil we were planted in and who cultivated that soil. If you go back far enough, all of those of us who have been scattered throughout the diaspora, you're going to find the oppressor having cultivated that soil, right? And so there's things that we've been taught to believe and things that we've been taught to do, ways we've been taught to respond that are conducive to them staying in a place of superiority and power over us, and we don't even realize it, right? Just even the way we interact with each other, the distrust that we tend to have for each other. 
the suspicion that we tend to deal with each other in, that's been cultivated into the soil that we've been grown up in or developed in. So when we talk about returning to the ancient path, one of those things we would return to is tribe. But if distrust has been cultivated in us, if suspicion of each other has been cultivated in us, then that's something that we're going to have to be, we're gonna have to overcome. We're gonna have to be delivered from that thing. We're gonna have to walk that out. We're gonna have to walk with the expected destination of righteousness and the kingdom of Yahuwah. The kingdom of Yahuwah, scripture says, is righteousness, peace, and joy, right? But if I can't trust you, how am I gonna treat you righteously? If I don't have joy in my heart, how am I going to be able to overcome your imperfections and flaws that irritate me, right? We can't do tribe if we're coming from a paradigm of distrust, a perspective of suspicion. So that's just one example of returning to an ancient path to a, a behavior or um, an activity that would be considered ancient path that we're hindered by because of our paradigm, because of our perspective. We talk about coming out of Babylon, but it's difficult when Babylon is in you. Yeah. So Yehuda just dropped something powerful on me, right? Um, so let me go over to Jeremiah 51, seven. Babel was a golden cup in the hand of Yahuwah, making drunk all the earth. The nations drank of her wine. That's why the nations went mad. So we don't understand the, the fullness or the complexity of Yahuwah. Amaz talk about a paradigm that has been shaped. You know that Yahuwah shaped your paradigm this way? Many not understand it. Yeah, Yahuwah shaped your paradigm. In falsehood. So that only those who are his exactly. can hear him. So so that means that if you're not hearing Yahuwah in this hour when he's trying to restore the ancient paths or restore the culture, it's because he hasn't chosen for you to hear. So we can talk about that in, I think it's Isaiah chapter 3, where the prophet tells uh, J Jerusalem, he tells him, he says, Yahuwah is going to close your ears where you can't even hear him when he yeah. speaks. Right? So he does that to those whom he has determined are not his. Your origin is not of him. There's only two orders in the earth. Yeah. The order of Melchizedek and the order of the serpent. Right? So we have to acknowledge that Yahuwah did these things and he was righteous in doing them. Because you first chose to go off the path. He says, I'll give you a strong delusion that you may believe a lie. Man, I'll shape your paradigm so corrupt that you won't be able to return from it unless I decide to bring you back. You want Babylon? You want America? You want Egypt? I'm going to give it to you. You've been in the wilderness. <laughs> they said, we want meat. Man, I'm going to give it to them until they're sick of it. Man, Yahuwah shaped your paradigm so corrupt that some people are so lost in it that they can't recover. And it's because Yahuwah has not decided to have them recover from a corrupted paradigm. He did it and he was righteous in doing it because you first chose to go that way. You first chose to go off the path because you didn't trust him from the start. Hallelujah. Uh, you want to say something, Emma? This goes back to a discussion that Ema Pam and I had today. And some people are so frustrated because people are not waking up. And I keep saying to these people, only Yahuwah can wake anybody up. And what we don't want to give up is that paradigm of evangelism that I woke somebody up, which is pride. We don't wake anybody up. We just better be grateful that we're awake. That's where it is. I'm so thankful that I woke up and am striving for perfection. I'm striving with all I know. But when it comes to other people, we have been taught that we have some kind of magic powers and that we should be able to just say the right thing or give them the right scripture or whatever. But it's only Yahuwah. And when we get to that point and realize that the frustration goes away, but what we don't want to do is 
go back to the scripture where he says, who is my mother? Who is my father? Who is my sister? Only those that obey the word and obey the law, statutes, and commandments. So um, it's, it's really hard to follow someone if, if they haven't died yet. That's really the, um, the, the key to all of this. Um, Yahushua said, then said Yahushua unto his disciples, if, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his execution stake and follow me. That says a lot. The only way you can really do this, if you've already died, and if you're a leader, and if you um, have not died, um, people probably will follow you. But if you have died, it's going to be hard. Um, that's why Shaul really didn't have nobody following him. But he set up assemblies. And he didn't. He actually said, they all left me. It's really deep when you die. It's hard to get followers. You can go minister. Because they don't know where you're going. Yeah. That's why Elijah said, go back, Alicia. You might not want to go where I'm going. Even the people said, you following Elijah? Do you know he's going, he going through Jericho? He's going through the Jordan? He said, hold your peace. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to stay with him until he's taken away from me. Then I'm coming back with excellent power. So this is the, um, the big thing about, like, even assemblies. And I know um, Mori Yahushua can um, vow to this. It's hard for people to constantly follow you um, if you've done this. And here's another one. Peter realized that. He even told Peter. He actually kind of told Peter um, to shut up. He says, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify Elohim. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. He said, I'm getting ready to die. It really don't matter. Are you ready to keep? Look what he said. Then Peter turned about, see the disciple whom Yahushua loved, following. That's Yahuqanon. Which also leaned on his breast at the supper. And the master, which is he that betrayed thee? Peter worried about the wrong thing. Because he realized this stuff is not a joke if you're right. really following the right man. Right. Peter seeing him said to Yahushua, Master, what shall this man do? What about him? Yahushua said unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Right. We know that Peter was going to have to hu get hung upside down. Right. So that's the problem. Um, people, it's hard for people, because people ain't really dead. Right. They just ain't denied their mother, father, wife. Right. That's when you dead. Right. Be out here with no mom and dad. Be out here in Melchizedek having no mother, no father, no beginning to end. There you you go. something different. That's right. Your origin, you Abraham. You your left origin. your father's house. Yeah. And you go into land that you don't know where it's at. Yeah. That's the ancient past. That's right. You going to deliver up Isaac? You sick with it. You my friend. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're dealing with. And I'm going to give you one more. Shaul said it best. This is why Shaul was able to say this. And a lot of people got problem with him. But he was able to do this. He says, be ye followers of me. Mm -hmm. How you gonna say that? He died. Yeah. As I am also of Mashiach. That's some very strong words. Yeah, because lest you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of Yahuwah. So it's gonna be a man out here traveling. Yeah. And he might end up by himself. Yeah. His wife might even leave him. Yeah. This is what we actually going into. This is what Mo was saying. But you have he, to cross over. You have to cross over because you can't, you cannot be a Hebrew having a righteous culture apart from having been born again. Because until you do that, you are just a planting here in Babylon. You have to give up your, your life in order to gain your life. That's my point, is that all the things that we can do and call it culture, the culture of the righteous is to be originated from Yahuwah, to be born of his spirit, to originate from him. That's why he said, 
those who are of me come out of her. Because if you're not of him, you won't be able to come out of her. And I could really just say one more thing here. I'm speaking this to women because you are the ones who are raising children, primarily. So the soil that you cultivate is either going to be soil that lends itself to a righteous planting or soil that lends itself to an unrighteous planting. If you yourself are still intertwined with the dealings of Babylon, you got to catch the latest uh, episode of Housewives of Atlanta or whatever. It's going to be hard for you to raise a child that's going to be able to adhere to the, the ancient path. You have to model being um, dead in your flesh. You have to model that um, in order for them to even perceive what that is and to desire it. So the culture of the righteous is to be born again and to do those things that were done by those who walked before us to reveal Yahuwah to the world. Because that's our whole purpose is to worship him, to have a relationship with him, and to reveal him that others might see, that the knowledge of Yahuwah would fill the earth. Hallelujah. So anything else that we're doing that's not about that is vanity, and the origin of it is probably Babylon. So to the mothers here and the mothers online, pay attention to the soil that you're cultivating the soil that your, your child is growing from. Because in order for him to or her to desire the righteous path, they have to be cultivated in soil that's righteous, soil that's conducive to it. So as we come um, with others who will come after me speaking on this topic of culture keeper, we're going to be looking at some of the things that we have taken pride in as part of our culture we're going to look at what they really mean and what is it that we're supposed to be doing with this information, with this knowledge. Why do you light a menorah? Why do you blow a shofar? Why do you wear zizits? So there will be different topics that we speak about in terms of a mother being able to present this information to her children. But the, the, the thing that I wanted to do tonight was to introduce the topic of the culture of the righteous. Because the culture of the righteous can only come from one who is originating from the Father, born of his Ruach HaKodesh. To be Hebrew, literally, it really means to cross over, to cross from this place into another place. I'm uprooted here. He says in Ephesians, I think, is it, is it Ephesians? Is it Ephesians 1, where he talks about tr being transplanted from darkness into light and the imagery that I always see when I think when I hear that scripture is it being plucked up uprooted from something and planted into his marvelous light right we can't even find the path until that happens so that's that's really what I wanted to to say tonight and um those who come behind me will go more deeply into these um iconic things that we look at as culture, and we're going to bring out, you know, what that has to do with, with true righteousness, right standing with Yahuwah, adhering to the path of Yahuwah. So I'm not going to go um, any, well, I'll say lastly, that typically when you look at culture, there's like seven elements of culture, uh, one of them being language. Um, and so um, we're definitely going to look at language. Um, we're going to look at uh, something like the shofar, and the, and the symbolism and, and what that has to do with us, who we ourselves are the shofar, right? So we're gonna look at different things in the culture and how we can cultivate soil around our children's understanding of these things so that they can become a planting that's able to hear Yahuwah, that's able to be transplanted, right? So if we wanna do some evangelism, um, we're gonna do it with our children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.